Well, all right, guys, it's really nice to have you here with me again this morning. And I just want to thank you for all of you who are watching the videos so faithfully and who are sharing them out. I thank you for all of you who are helping finance this channel. Uh, let's just get the truth out in these last days. Let's do everything that we can. Be praying for me that I can do that. Now, in this video, we're going to continue on with the Spiritual Warfare series. And last time, just as a reminder, we saw how the devil wants to beat us down. He is able to take those natural feelings we all experience, tiredness and weariness, in our task and then use them to discourage us, to make us think the task is far too difficult for us to complete. He gets us to forget about what has been done already and focus only on what still needs to be done and then magnifies the difficulty, causing us to want to give up. When I was a missionary in England, I can't tell you how many missionaries I saw come over. They were so excited about their call from God, and they were the ones that God was going to use in a great way. But England is extremely hard spiritual ground, and churches, if they grow at all, do so at a snail's pace. Now, I would watch as discouragement began to replace that excitement they once felt, and eventually they would quit and head back home. The devil got them to focus only on what wasn't happening instead of what was. I mean, they would be thinking the church is so small, and it is so hard to get anybody to come in. I remember one night in our midweek study when I was a missionary there, I was looking around and throwing a very impressive pity party for myself. I'm thinking, where is everybody? How come so few care? I worked so hard to put these studies together. For who? Just a handful of people? Is it worth it at all? But the Lord whispered to me, whispered to my heart, don't focus on who isn't here. Look at who is. And as I looked around, I saw people who had been spiritually sick and apathetic, who had come back to life again. I saw a marriage that had been restored, a person who had been saved, and another who had been delivered from a life of depression and was now filled with the joy of the Lord. And so I bowed my head and silently confessed my sin. Lord, I'm sorry. You have done wonderful things here, and I'm whining because my ego is hurt. Please forgive me and help me to find my joy in what you are doing, in your plan and in your timing. Help me to find joy in who is here and not whine about who is not. Then we also saw how the devil will use past failures to depress us. Perhaps a sin we look back on and feel so ashamed. See, the devil wants to fix our gaze on the ugliness of our failure rather than on the beauty of the work of Christ and God's forgiveness. So we spent a long time looking at how secure we are in Christ because of what he has done, even when we fail. And that brings us to this study. And this next one is interesting. It is the exact opposite of being beat down with discouragement and depression. This is being lifted up in pride. And so this is the satanic scheme of pride. Now, some believe the devil only beats us down to depress us. But no, he will do exactly the opposite and exalt us. Some have called pride the sin, the mother of sins that gives birth to all the rest. Isaiah tells us in chapter 14, it's why the devil fell. He didn't want to be second in the kingdom. He wanted to be worshipped like God, so he rebelled against him. And that shows us how deceitful pride can be. It convinced Satan he could beat God. You're strong enough. You're clever enough. You can do this. And it's interesting. So many of the false teachers today want the same thing. They want to be like God. Listen to Kenneth Copeland in his sermon, Following the Faith of Abraham. God's reason for creating Adam was his desire to reproduce himself. I mean a reproduction of himself. And in the Garden of Eden, he did just that. He, Adam, was not a little like God. He was not almost like God. He was not um, subordinate to God even. Adam is as much like God as you could get. Just the same as Jesus. Adam in the Garden of Eden was God manifested in the flesh. What? Kenneth Hagin put it this way. Man was created on terms of equality with God, and he could stand in God's presence without any consciousness of inferiority. God has made us as much like himself as possible. He made us the same class of being that he is himself. Man lived in the realm of God. He lived on terms equal with God. The believer is called Christ. That's who we are. 
we are Christ. Well, that's insane. But I only say this to warn you. Christianity is filled with this kind of heresy today. So guys, you've got to know your Bible. Check who is influencing you, including me. Check them, check me with Scripture. Okay, but back to pride now. This is such an effective tactic of the devil, and it is such a destroyer of God's work. I have seen so many gifted men be put on the shelf because of a proud pastor over them. Maybe he has to be out of town, so he gives them a chance in the pulpit. And they prepare well, and they preach a sermon that God uses. And so the pastor returns, and the congregation tells him that his replacement was really good. Guess what? That's the last sermon they preach in that church. Why? Because a proud little man cared more about guarding his own little kingdom than promoting the kingdom of God. Nobody's going to threaten his limelight. He's the man. It reminds me of Saul. When God called him, he was very humble. Samuel tells him that God's plan is that he would be king of Israel. And look at his reply, 1 Samuel 9, 21. Saul answered, but am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such a thing to me? In other words, I'm nothing. Why would God choose me? But soon Saul started to like being something, and it went to his head. He liked being the man. He liked all the glory going to him. And when David started to steal some of the adulation he craved, he couldn't handle it. He pursued David all over Israel, trying to kill him. So if any pastors are listening, please be careful of pride. You can hold people back that God wants to use. I always thought the leader's job was to push others forward, encourage them to be used, and rejoice when they are. Why? Because two ministers in a church are better than one. Four are better than two. The more, the better, because we're pushing forward a kingdom against satanic resistance, and the more warriors we can train and get involved in the fight, the more effective we're going to be. See, I think the pastor or any leader should be an enabler of dreams. I mean, you have people in your church that just want to be used, but they don't know how. I always look for people who had potential in the churches I was over. Then I would encourage them to step out. Let's see what the Lord can do with you. If it was teaching, I would tell them, you know what, I'll help you put a study together. And I'd give them my notes to see how they could do it, to see how I did it. I'd encourage them, let's see what the Lord will do. There's something there. I see it. So let's not bury that gifting. But you know what? That's messy to get others involved. Wouldn't it just be easier to do it myself? Well, you know what? Yes. Trusting others that are just starting out is much more difficult. It doesn't always go smoothly. Mistakes are made. But you know what? People who want to serve God don't want to make mistakes. They want to do good. But mistakes are just as part of the learning process. And if you get mad when mistakes are made, and I've seen that so many times, just remember all the mistakes you have made and still make. Think of the grace you've been shown by God and treat others in the same way he's treated you. I remember one time I had convinced a person to start getting used to being in front of people and suggested he get on the schedule for doing announcements. I mean, that is a great way to get people accustomed to speaking in front of others. So he walks up to do the announcements, and it was terrible. He stuttered. He lost his place. He got announcements wrong. Maybe the worst announcements ever. And I was in the back of the room when he sheepishly came back, and I was smiling. Now, I know this is mean, but I thought it was pretty funny. And, you know, it was just a mistake. It's no big deal. The church wasn't going to be hurt by it. He just looked at me, you know what he said? He said, I'm so glad I go to a church that believes in grace. Be careful, leaders. If you overreact to mistakes, you'll create an atmosphere of fear where nobody will take chances and be creative. They will just hunker down and try to stay in the comfort zone where they are safe and no mistakes are made because they're afraid of your anger. But grace promotes creativity. Your people will know they will still be loved and accepted even when they mess up. Now, I'm not talking about somebody who comes in unprepared. You're going to have to deal with that. That's on them. But for those who prepare and care and are just human, who get nervous, who make mistakes just like we do, give them grace. Be godly. Encourage them. Don't worry about it. 
you'll get better and better. You know what that man ended up who did those announcements and just blew it so badly? That man ended up getting better and better and started teaching for me at times and became an elder in the church. He was such a blessing. And it was such a joy to watch him advance spiritually to where he could be used like that. Now, lest you think I've got this humility thing wired because of stories like that, I have plenty of examples where I'm the poster child when it comes to pride. The only reason I learned to push others forward and not worry about being the man, it came from experience and the frustration of thinking I could do it all myself, that I was the man and didn't need help. I was a mission pastor in Southern California, and God really started to bless the program. We sent out a number of missionaries all over the world, and desiring to be a good sending church, I wanted to stay in regular contact with those we sent. But I was also teaching a weekly study at the time and leading worship for a men's study, then add in things like counseling and helping to run the church. You know, there's a reason why pastors look tired. So I tried to be a good mission pastor, but I just failed miserably. Nothing was happening. The missionaries weren't being taken care of like they should be. So it was frustrating for them, and it was frustrating for me. Finally, the Lord was able to convince me that I needed help, that I couldn't do it that I had become the bottleneck that was where everything was being stopped. So I prayed for four men to come and help me. And within a month, the Lord brought them forward and the mission program just took off. They were getting blessed because they were serving the Lord. The missionaries were getting blessed because they were being taken care of. And I was getting blessed because I was no longer feeling guilty because I wasn't taking care of the missionaries. I mean, win, 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 right? That was a lesson I never forgot. A one-man show is not a blessing for anybody. The more who can minister, the better. And that's why I carried that lesson into whatever church I was over after that, when I had become senior pastor. But no wonder Satan uses pride, right? A proud man or woman can hinder the kingdom by holding down those around them. And listen to this, James 4, 6. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So they hold down those they are over, and God holds them down. What a miserable state. Again, no wonder Satan wants to produce pride in us. But I find pride really interesting. When you think about it, you would think that a proud person would be so secure they wouldn't be threatened by anything. But that's not true. They are threatened by everything. You know what? I like to watch people. It's interesting to see how somebody who is proud of their looks acts when a better-looking person walks into the room, you see the insecurity. Watch a proud pastor's reaction when they hear about another church really being blessed. Do they rejoice? Do they think, fantastic, the kingdom is being enlarged and advanced? No, they're bothered. They become envious. Why? Because they aren't about the kingdom of God. They are about themselves. It's their kingdom they want to protect and advance. And that's a good test whether you are proud or not. Can you rejoice when another is blessed or does it bother you? But let's be honest. This is something we all must fight, right? It is something we all must deal with and will be dealing with all of our life. Lawrence J. Peter said this, There are two kinds of egotists, those who admit it and the rest of us. Now, I played lead guitar in a Christian alternative band, and a kid came in to watch us practice. After practice ended, he asked if he could play my guitar. You know, I said, sure. And you know, I was thinking, maybe I'll even show you some things afterwards. You know what? That kid just shredded. He was so much better than me. Was I rejoicing in his talent? No. I was humbled, and I didn't like it one bit. Fortunately, again, the Lord dealt with me and I confessed my pride and asked the Lord to help me to be like him. I mean, he is God. God, make me like you. He is God and he humbled himself coming to earth as a man to die on a cross for me. And I get all upset over somebody being a better guitarist. I prayed the Lord would use him and his talent for the kingdom. Philippians tells us about our Lord's incarnation. And this is interesting. Philippians 2, 6 Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. In other words, he didn't walk around protecting his ego. You think you're great? Hey, I'm God, buddy. Yeah, that's right, God. He let all that go and chose to walk in humility and love, and he chose to serve others. But we, 
me, we cling to so many things we think are going to impress others. Those things we can't wait to slide into the conversation. And we're all so prone to this. And Satan is always trying to push us to these extremes. There's two extremes he tries to get us on. If he can't depress us, you know, fine. Then let's try exaltation. I'll convince them how wonderful they are, how much better they are than others. Both will work equally as well. And again, the warning, James 4, 6. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, I've got another story about me. I obviously need to be more humble, but humility is a lifelong pursuit, isn't it? God is always busting me over some new area of pride, and sometimes it's really painful. When we first went to England, I thought I had the whole thing, this whole ministry thing, figured out. I'd been teaching in a large church. I was also the missions pastor, like I had mentioned, and I was involved in pastoral training, and everything that we were doing was fairly successful. Now, I had heard that ministry in England was hard. But hey, I know what I'm doing. I've been called and trained, so this shouldn't be a problem at all. You know, oh yeah, I know others had failed, but I'm going to be different. And so I gave England my best shot, and it didn't flinch. And after a year of my brilliant leadership and anointed teaching, I had grown the church from eight to five. And three of those five was me, my wife, and my son. Finally, and I'll never forget it, I went up into our bedroom, I closed the door behind me, and I fell on my face and cried out to God. I pleaded for help. I admitted that apparently I didn't know what I was doing and I was obviously not sufficient for this task. I confessed my pride and surrendered the church to God, acknowledging that if anything was going to happen, it had to be him doing it. And it was at that point, the point I became needy, the point I admitted I couldn't do it and was in desperate need of God getting involved, at that point, the church began to grow. But as long as I was proud, as long as I thought I was sufficient for the work, there could be no blessing. God opposed me being blessed. In love, he had to break me. He had to get my eyes off of me and fix them on him and his abilities. Then he could bless, because then he would get the glory. C.S. Lewis said something interesting. He said, a proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. So pride is a destroyer. The proud man holds others down who might steal some of his glory. And God must hold the proud man down because he can't bless him in that state. He must oppose him. Opposed by God, I mean, that should scare us straight, right? That should make us fear pride, and that should make us see why Satan works so hard to make us proud. He's not afraid of what we can do if our pride is stopping God from helping us. So, oh God, help us fight this monster, right? Help us to see where it has gripped our hearts. Help us not to be threatened by another's success. Help us let you push us out of the center of our lives and our affections so you can sit on that throne instead. And friends, this is going to take God's help because pride comes so naturally to us, doesn't it? I mean, I like feeling better than others. Bernard Bailey said this, when science discovers the center of the universe, a lot of people will be disappointed to find they are not it. Well, time for another (laughs) self-confession. Man, something I learned almost 40 years ago and a lesson I've never forgotten. I felt called to the ministry and really wanted to work at the church full time. I mean, that was my dream job. And eventually a position opened up, but was given to a person I felt was less qualified than me. He was happy and excited, you know, but I wasn't. I didn't follow the command to rejoice when another rejoices. I struggled. I didn't rest in the truth that God knew what he was doing. Inwardly, I was grumbling. I was murmuring. How can he be chosen before me? I'm a better teacher. I'm more spiritual, blah, blah, blah. Now, I had a great job at the time, but I was struggling working there because I should be the one who had got hired at the church. The root of bitterness was affecting everything. It was eating me up. Just another reason Satan loves pride, right? It opens the door to bitterness and jealousy Pride just allows all these other sins to spread through your heart. And when he would teach, I'd be sitting in the congregation and I would get nothing out of it. 
I couldn't receive anything from this usurper who had my position. Again, bitterness. I was proud and God opposed me getting that job. I wasn't spiritually ready for it. But thankfully, God again (laughs) dealt with me. I'm so grateful he doesn't let us continue in these sinful attitudes that hinder our growth and stop us from being used. And all this bitterness and resentment ended when I finally surrendered it all to God. When I humbled myself and prayed, God, you know what you're doing. You have your reasons why you chose this other man instead of me. So I thank you that you never make a mistake in how you plan for my life. So right now, you have me at this job and I thank you for it. It's a good job. So even if I never go full-time at church, I choose to be faithful here. I want to work in a way that brings you glory. Help me to have the right attitude. And this part is really important. Rather than being bitter, I started praying for the man that was hired instead of me. I prayed for him every day, praying that God would bless him and use him. When he taught, I prayed for him while he was teaching. And you know what? That joy that pride and the resulting bitterness had stolen, it returned. I had a wonderful peace as I concentrated on my walk with God and working in a way that brought him glory at the job I already had. I discovered that God opposes the proud, but when we choose humility, when we humble ourselves before him, grace rushes in. And now listen to this. Within a few months, that man didn't work out. That job opened up again and they asked me to come on staff. See, God couldn't allow me to have that job until I dealt with that pride in my heart. I wasn't ready for it. And so he put me through that trial, put me through that time of frustration so that that pride could be exposed. And then when it was dealt with, then all of a sudden the job opened up and I was able to go on staff. But the pride had to be dealt with first. And until it was, God opposed me going on staff there at church. And I don't know about you, but I've had a lifelong battle against pride. But every God-enabled victory has taught me another invaluable lesson. The truth is, I know I have nothing to be proud about. Pride can only happen when I choose to use the wrong standard of measurement. When I measure myself against other men, I can always find somebody I do things better than. But here's the thing. My standard is not other men. It is Jesus Christ, right? Uh Uh-oh. When I measure myself against that standard, against him, humility is the only possible outcome. I see that I fall way short of what I should be, but I'm still loved and I'm still accepted. I see the grace of God for even a person like me. And you know what that does? That shows me how I should treat others the same way God is treating me. And anything good I have that could produce pride. I need to see where that comes from. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. For who makes you so superior? What do you have that you didn't receive? If, in fact, you did receive it, why do you boast as if you hadn't received it? So do you do things well? Are you talented? Maybe you're a good teacher. Are you good looking? Do you have a great personality? God gave those things to you. So what are you boasting about? James 1, 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. So, thank Him for your gifts and use them for His glory, knowing it takes His touch upon them to be used properly. Well, that's enough for now. Enough of my self-confession. I obviously need to be humbled. There are more wiles we will cover as we look at the spiritual armor starting next week. Well, God bless you. Thank you for your prayers and thank you for your support. I love you and I'll see you guys next week.